uh, to everybody that are listening to us and uh, today it is the second uh, talk from our uh, cloud physics lecture series today's talk is by professor andrew hinesfield he is a senior scientist at uh, um, ncar in mesoscale micro scale meteorology laboratory and um, uh, we i don't need to introduce professor hinesfield he is actually is a world Hello, madam. We can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so the um, he is actually. We don't need to introduce him because uh, he is very well known in uh, ice microphysics studies, and he did his PhD in cloud physics and meteorology from University of Chicago and graduated in 1973. He um, and uh, he has over 400 publications with more than 22. Uh, thousand citations, uh, and uh, he is awarded uh, a four-year NASA traineeship to attend graduate school, and was participated in uh, numerous NASA science investigations since 1985. And uh, he was honored with a NASA Distinguished Inve Investigator Award in uh, 2006. And uh, Professor Hansfield led many field campaigns, and. Uh, Mm, he is uh, actually it is a blessing that he has uh, indeed uh, come to uh, us and uh, now he is he'll be delivering his talk and thank you so much for attending thank you professor okay. hansfield please okay thank you tara uh, and um, good afternoon everybody good morning everybody here and so i will talk about the ice phase from observations in clouds and at the surface and quite a bit of the work that I'll be presenting is recent. So I will give you, though, I will start off by a historical view of the ice phase. What have people done early on? And then I want to talk about some recent things I've worked on. What is the fraction of the Earth's precipitation that is due to the ice phase? How warm can it snow? I will find out here tomorrow because there is a forecast of possibility of some light snow. And then what is the change in the height of the melting layer due to global warming? And how has snow reaching the surface receded that is decreased due to global warming? My first slide then will show you a couple of things. Well, you know, I guess and for me, I've been asked, why study snow and ice in clouds and at the ground? And, you know, there are quite a few reasons, approximately 40%. And I put a little question mark there because I have thought that for many years. And so I finally decided to do something about it. Approximately 40% of the Earth's precipitation is produced through the ice phase with associated latent heating. And, of course, to improve weather and climate prediction models. And study the role of clouds on climate. So those are good reasons. And so the Chinese ideograms, that is, diagrams representing ice and snow, have been in existence for at least, believe this, 3,000 years. And so the earliest existing records are those engraved on the bones, uh, oracle bones of this dynasty. Aside from the usual usage in weather, they are often used to describe the color white. And then the, uh, this this book reads, in the Mount Mio Gu Yi, there lives a goddess whose flesh and skin are as white as ice and snow and who looks like a graceful and beautiful virgin. And so this snow has been studied for a long time. And the first U European who wrote about the shape of snow is Magnus in <clears throat> 1200, year 1200. And uh, he says snow crystals were star-shaped. And then... Uh, he, uh, Magnus also wrote that snow crystals could have shapes like crescents, arrows, and many different shapes. 
And uh, then for the first time in 1591, this uh, Dr. Harriet correctly recognized the hexagonal nature of snow crystals. And then is quite therefore an impressive feat that in 135 BC, a scholar talked about the hexagonal shape of snow crystals. Flowers and plants and trees are five pointed, but those of snow, which are called ying, are always six pointed. And then I would be um, not telling you everything. Uh, if I didn't tell you just a little bit about the snowflake man. And so under the microscope, Bentley, who lived in the United States in Virginia, found, in uh, Vermont, found that snowflakes were miracles of beauty. And it seemed a shame that this beauty should not be seen and appreciated. And then um, he, he uh, wrote a book. And uh, I have many pictures from that book. And then um, I just highlighted this thing, um, just a little bit about him. He was one who coined the expression, no two snowflakes are alike. And so he would go on to capture more than 5,000 snowflakes during his lifetime, not finding any two alike. And so these are snow crystals on the right. And... So he, uh, his book is called Snow Crystals, and it contained more than 2,400 snow crystal images. And so um, that is a little bit about the snowflake man. And so just to bring you up to speed, because many of you probably have no, never seen snow in real life, these are some of the common shapes that ice crystals grow in. And so ice crystals and um, the lower ones, the ones in the bottom panel, are rhymed. That is snow crystals that have collected water drops. And so as you get further to the lower right bottom, you'll see those are starting to look like grapple or small hail. So these are some of the common shapes. And then many of these um, I show here are uh, especially um, this one, these here, those grow at very low temperatures. And these, the more pristine looking ones, grow at a temperature of about minus 15. And so here's just some more examples. I feel I should show those to you. And so these are very simple particles. These are the low temperature ones, and these are the ones that grow in liquid water clouds where they pick up, where the ice crystals pick up water droplets. And some of the shapes can be very complex. And this just shows a diagram indicating the temperatures at which these different particles grow at. So it's highly temperature dependent. That is, crystals grow uh, depending on their um, initial temperature, and that might be modified as they fall down through a cloud. And so the complex, the pristine looking ones are right in this region, minus eight to minus 18 or so. And then, um, these needle-like crystals are very common, and they're very uh, often indicators of a secondary ice production process, which I won't discuss here. And then uh, it's also a function of relative humidity. So as the relative humidity increases, they become more uh, pristine looking. Okay, and I got this uh, photograph from Helmut Weichmann, he uh, passed away a number of years ago. This is a picture in 1941 of his airplane. And he was flying for the German Air Force. His role was to create contrails because military aircraft do not like to be seen at, 
by visible contrails. So he was looking to try to find out what conditions were conducive to contrail formation. And he had an instrument sticking out from uh, his uh, from his aircraft, and he would collect ice crystals in there and bring them back to the ground. And here is a, this is a picture from him of his airplane. He gave this to me, and uh, that shows co uh, some contrails that he was generating. And this is the aircraft I flew in to do my PhD. And these were the very original uh, microphysical probes here. They've come a long way since then. And my seat was here, and I would be collecting ice crystals through the side of the window here. And we would fly up to 27,008 kilometers or eight and a half kilometers to collect some cirrus crystals, which I did my thesis on. And it was cold. And then this is a more modern looking aircraft probe. This is the NASA DC-8 aircraft. And so they've come a long way since then. <clears throat> this is an instrument which we developed, I developed, to collect ice crystals and the ice crystals would go, this would go on a balloon, and the ice crystals would be collected here. And this tape was coated with a liquid plastic so that impressions of the ice crystals were left in this liquid plastic, and the liquid um, uh, became solid as the solvent dissol uh, vaporized. And so, Here's, uh, we got some great data with this, and let me show you the next slide. So here's just an example of how we were collecting data. This is our instrument. And so these are just some examples of images we collected. And uh, this is a vertical profile that we put together from data we collected. The beauty of this instrument is that it provides a vertical profile. And so you can see the growth downward and the complex forms I mentioned. The resolution is terrific of this instrument. And so now I wanted to start <clears throat> telling you a little bit about more recent work, which I've been enjoying. And so, I did a study looking at the fraction of the Earth's precipitation that's due to the ice phase. And so here is the surface precipitation components, and I'll call that PR. So it's due to a combination, and this is global, of snow that reaches the surface at temperatures below zero C. This is temperature. And then it has a rain component, and, um, and rain can be due to melting snow. So the rain component would form by ice crystals go off, they would go through the melting layer to warmer temperatures, and then there'd be rain. And then there can be a warm component. Sorry, this is, this is the S component called snow, and the rain component here, and then W indicates warm rain. That is, the rain is produced entirely due to the liquid phase. And then SS is snow reaching the surface. So globally, this is what would be a, a, the resulting precipitation at the ground. Okay, so I did this study using a combination of a number of things. And so I used two radar products. That is CloudSat, the CloudSat 94, 95 gigahertz W-band radar, and GPM, which is another satellite-based radar, and 
and that has KU and KUA bands, a little more, uh, um, a little better at looking heavy rain, and this is looking at very light rain generally. And so, and then CAM, I use the community atmosphere model from NCAR, and then there's another satellite-based radar in space, and which is KU band, which is the trim radar, and then, so I've looked at trim, GPM separately. And then there is a global product, which is based on uh, satellite-based observations, as well as a number of surface observations. And uh, that's called GPROS. And then I use the UK Met Office model. And uh, so here's another precipitation product here. And so what I show here is latitudinally the mean precipitation rate globally. And so as you see here, there's a peak at around uh, 40 degrees here and another peak right in here. And then um, kind of a, dull, a minima between this and the obvious high precipitation rates this is averaged, um, and so high precipitation rates uh, near zero uh, near uh, the la equator. So here you see the various products follow reasonably well. CloudSat, which I said is good for light precipitation, is very poor for getting the higher precipitation rates, which is why I use CloudSat plus GPM products. So what I'm, I will show you then are a combination of products from satellite-based sensors as well as weather forecast models and other products. And so this is the W component. This is the fraction of the total precipitation, and this is 60%, which is due to warm rain. And so here, the... Uh, so actually, you see that in near the equator, uh, the warm rain process is not a dominant one, whereas at about 20 degrees north and south, warm rain is a significant component of all precipitation. And then there is even a warm rain product at very high latitudes, but not a lot. And so you see here, though, the, Kind of an average might be 30% due to warm rain. So that means that all the other is due to some aspect of the ice phase. And so this shows the mean precipitation rate for the various products. And so CloudSat GPM, here's the trim radar, which is uh, only goes up to about 30 north and south. So this is probably the product I would trust the most. And so mean precipitation rates are pretty high. GPM gets almost all of it. And I don't show here clouds that, but, and then the CAM model, you know, shows kind of a similar pattern. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. And the UK Met Office model it has a little bit higher values, but similar shape. So this is a summary of what I found. So this is uh, snow which melts to rain. And this is uh, uh, rain, the uh, warm rain edition. Uh, this is, okay. So this is the melting of snow. This is ice and snow added by through the rain process. This is warm rain. And then this is snow reaching the surface. So regarding uh, the amount of snow reaching the surface, and these are the two model results. This is UK and this is the CAM model. And first thing to notice here is the rather small amount of snow adding to global precipitation 
due to snow reaching the surface. The warm rain process, I show here the values right here. And so about 22%, almost a quarter of the Earth's precip is due to warm rain. And you see here, these are very, very different. So the models are not getting the warm rain process very well. And then this is uh, the uh, component that just falls right to the surface as uh, rain, but melts. And so about almost 60% is due to snow that melts to rain. And the models are all over the place. And, and so this is just the rain. Com this is the component of rain to the total, not this entire process, but just the rain component. So about 15%. And, and so, you know, but the important thing is that the um, I, snow, snow is responsible for about 57 plus maybe 5% of the Earth's total precipitation. And so a good number might be 63%. And what I have been thinking for years is 40% because no one had really looked at it. So that kind of quantifies how important the ice phase is to global precipitation. Even though where you are, this is the component you get. Um, it's still very important. So the, the satellite-based products therefore provide a benchmark for determining whether climate model simulations were reasonable, both latitudinally for regional averages and for global averages. And the component S together with component SS indicates that, as I mentioned, about 63% of the Earth's precip comes from the ice phase. The remaining 37% is from a combination of water vapor and liquid water added by the component, the warm rain process, temperatures above zero degrees C, about 15%, and from warm rain only, about 23%. Okay, so now I want to go on to a little thing that was of interest to me for a long time. How warm can can it snow? And so this is a conceptual view of ice particle melting. And so this is the relative humidity with respect to water. This is the temperature. What I show here is a sublimation zone. That is when an ice particle, for example, is generated aloft and then falls to temperatures above zero C and the humidity is low, the ice particles will not melt. They will sublimate, that is evaporate. And so any particles in here will melt. So if an ice particle starts off up here at zero C going through the melting layer and then the humidity is increases to about, for example, eight, it's about 80%, then uh, the melting will commence at two degrees C. And so melting will only occur instantaneously at the zero C level when the humidity is 100%. And this is something people haven't looked at in the past, but it is, and I will explain why, relative humidity dependent, I should say altitude dependent, height dependent. So at 500 millibars, you see here that the snow can sublimate first before melting. So that is if an ice particle comes down here and makes it to this point here, and then at 500 millibars, it'll make it to this point here before melting. So it's evaporating and then finally melting in here. And so a lot of the data which I, I used for this study were collected during these aircraft spirals. So the aircraft would stop or start at some predetermined altitude or temperature, I should say, 
Typically, we did minus 10 to minus 15. And then it would spiral down, drifting with the wind. And I show here colors which indicate the temperature. And so it would spiral downwards at about the mean fall speed of the snow particles because we determined a descent rate of about a meter per second. And then we would just follow particles as they melted. So a lot of the data which I used for the study were derived that way. And these are just some images of ice particles, and I will show you why. Uh, here is, these are examples, these are 2D, two-dimensional images of ice crystals from one of the spirals, and this is the temperature here. So this is at five degrees C. And you can clearly see these are snow particles that are in the process of melting. And so over here, you still see some indications at plus 6C. And these are, are images from the high volume precipitation sampler. It has not as good resolution, but can sample centimeter or larger particles. And here you see, in this case at plus 6C, clearly there are ice particles. This one's at 4.8, this one's at 5. And then this is 6.4. So you clearly see the, there's ice at these temperatures. So we did these Lagrangian spirals. I showed you the, the, the uh, example of the flight tracks. And so here, in this case, we started off at about 12 plus 12 C and did the spiral downward. And here's the temp. This, these are all time plots. So you see here, we started reaching zero degrees C here, and then continue to descend. And what I've indicated here are color-coded the phases of the particles. So blue indicates it's all snow. This color here shows it's mostly snow. And we derive these from the particle images I just showed you. And the yellow shows mostly rain. And then the red shows all rain. So in this case, you see here a clear example of uh, snow, which is the images I just showed you in this case, reaching down to plus 6C. Now, here's associated relative humidity. And again, color code in the same way. So you see here the humidity in this particular case was dry. So it was low, it was very low. And as we got further and further down, it became lower and lower. So the humidity was in that schematic I showed you in the zone just where ice particles should be sublimating. And then here we're finally at rain. And this shows the median volume diameter of the particle population. So in the, in the rain, region in the temperatures above zero C, this particular case shows that the uh, particles were all rain here and the, the on average were increasing. And then as soon as we hit the melting layer about here, you see here the rapid, rather rapid decrease in the sizes. And that was due to sublimation. And this is the ice water content. That is, uh, it really should be labeled condensed water content. No, it shouldn't. This is the ice water content of the particle population since there was no liquid above. And so here you see it's relatively constant, but in the sublimation zones, rapidly decreasing. The next case is just another example of the same thing. And so from this, we could get some pretty good statistics. And this was another interesting uh, experiment, Kwajalein experiment, and Kwajalein Marshall Islands. And so this shows a case where the humidity was high. So here's the relative humidity, and it's pretty high. See here, uh, zero degrees C 
is about uh, right here. So humidity is quite high. And here you see then this mostly snow is just a short zone, mostly rain in here for a large region. And then here you see rain. So you clearly see that effect. And then here's the median volume diameter. And here, I guess the humidity is sufficiently low to cause some sublimation. But the other reason the median volume diameter changes is due to melting. So that is, you know, the snow then shrinks to basically a water drop. So that shows it here. Again, you see it dropping off rapidly as it melts. So this is a summary of all the cases we did. And um, again, humidity, this is temperature. This is relative humidity. This was a very dry case. And you see here the snow persisting, another dry case, and a third one. Whereas this, these three were moist. And you see how different they are. So clearly shows it here. And uh, this was a rather short spiral, but clearly um, uh, this one was a lower humidity and it, it persists longer. So you see here it, it is temperature dependent, but there still is some rain and snow, even in high humidity cases um, at plus 3C. So I don't want to do this one. And so basically then the upshot, is these are um, sublimation occurs here and melting here. And so I just want to summarize by saying that you see here when the humidity is low, you can get, you can get um, some degree of melting, but you can also get very high uh, temperatures for the snow to persist. And we quantified this in our article. And then another thing that I just happened to work on with uh, Andy Prain at NCAR was the increased, increased melting layer height due to global warming. And so this is in a paper, paper in Nature and we looked at the change in the melting layer height with time. And so this is global here. And you see here the rather large, uh, and we normalize this for 1980. So one year would be 1980. And so things are looked at relative to that. And so before 1980, the melting layer was lower. And now, globally, it's about 100 meters, actually we calculate about 120 globally. And so that has implications, which I'll discuss in just a moment. Uh, but as you can infer, that would affect the amount of snow reaching the surface. And so this is global land areas, even a little bit higher, and global ocean, a little bit lower. And then we quantified it by the various geographic locations. And so here you see North America, and then uh, Africa, Asia, is not quite as dramatic a change. I won't get into, the, the, we, we use different products here. And then Australia, very little. So it looks like the greatest, largest changes have really been in uh, North America and, uh, uh, and also in Europe. Not so much in South America, Asia. And so that has lots of implications. And uh, I, I won't go into the various products, but, um, you know, so 
The important thing, though, is just to show you. I, I, I won't go into these in too detail. A and so, w one other thing we wanted to look at was um, the potential snowfall area. That is, and you you may not know this, but snow provides a much better water pack than rain. Rain runs off. Snow can percolate over time into the ground. So snow is a tremendous advantage when it comes to preserving the water pack. And so increased global warming or increased height of the melting layer decreases the amount of snow at the surface. And so we did a study, follow-up study, which shows the potential snowfall area by year from 1980 to present. And so here you see different products, but Northern Hemisphere land area. So this has decreased quite a bit with time. And Northern Hemisphere ocean, still a decrease. Southern Hemisphere land, as I mentioned, there hasn't been much change in the height of the melting layer, and that sort of suggests it is quite indicative from this plot here. And then Southern Ocean Hemisphere, likewise. So it looks like North America is most impacted. And I won't go into detail. So I'm going to summarize by saying and I've uh, left the references for those papers in, in my talk. There have been dramatic improvements in the knowledge of ice and snow crystal properties in cloud and at the ground and have been made over the past decade. The global distribution of ice and snow cloud properties are changing dramatically over the past decade and presumably in the future. Global climate modeling constrained by observations will help us identify how the global water budget will be changing. And so that is my basic talk. And um, I'll see if I can figure out how to exit this. And uh, so that is um, the end of my talk. Thank you, uh, Andy. And uh, right now we are not able to hear you by some reason. But uh, yeah, um, now Mahin will be uh, looking for any questions uh, from the audience. If you let us uh, address those questions, and then we will have some discussion. Yeah. Um, uh, I have one question. Um, uh, like. Yeah, uh, uh, the global distribution of uh, warm warm rain and uh, uh, you have shown that is uh, that has any uh, seasonal uh, dependency. Can you hear? We can't hear him. And sometimes we are hearing you. Yeah. Earlier you fixed it, so similar way. <laughs> we are not able to hear you. We have a lot of questions to ask you though. Not able to hear you. Can you hear Mahin? No, I can't hear. Yeah. He is able to he is able to hear us, but uh, uh, And then come back. Yeah, yeah, it's working fine now. Uh, 
Hello, Andy. Can you see the question I wrote in that chat box? He is logging in my again. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, no question from the audience. Mm -hmm. So we will only ask madam. Yeah. So 63% of the precipitation is uh, from ice base. That's yeah. what he said, right? What do we do? Yeah. Yeah. What do we do? We have to make a decision whether to stop now or uh, we can we can call him for a discussion later. If, No, what I understood he is logging back again he is trying to connect. Uh, are there questions? Okay. Yeah, two questions are there. There are some questions. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there are some questions. How the increasing melting level might impact the rain? How do ice radiance in mixed mix cloud and ice phase clouds were discriminated? Yeah, he is not. Uh, he is still having trouble. Then uh, maybe. Uh, uh, no, right now I could not uh, call him. So maybe we will then uh, stop. Or yeah. We'll we'll call him in interact with him in another session. And yeah. Okay, okay. No longer has access to the chat. Okay. Um, okay, again I'm posting. Andy, can you hear? And let him log in. Okay. No longer access to the chat. Okay. So give me my chat. Madam, we can't hear you. We can stop now. If, uh, yeah.
पदमाकर वी आर नॉट सीइंग हिम I'll post a message. In the... Yeah, yeah. You post a message that uh, we'll have a discussion uh, yeah. later. Hmm? Then yeah. next topic. Padmasar, there is a request to have the screen fully, like, uh, maximize the screen. Not now, in the future uh, lectures, to do that. Okay. Yeah. okay, then we can... Okay, thank you.